And so as, as I was saying, the people that moves into the landscape brings their culture forms with them, and they will try to conserve them for as long as they can, but unconsciously and very slowly over long periods of time, thousands of years, in some cases centuries, uh, the native culture forms will begin to slowly thrust their way up into the expression language, the form styles that have come across into the landscape. In our case, for example, our comic book superheroes are all Native American characters. As I remarked elsewhere, Spider-Man and Batman and Wolverine, these are all Native American characters. Uh, and this is not to say that Bob Kane, when he created Batman, knew that the, one of the primary gods of the Maya was the Batman, didn't know it. It's precisely the point that he unconsciously creates this figure as one of the forms of the land. It's, it's rooted in, in the landscape. Uh, but the villains, um, normally what happens when a people moves into a landscape, as for example when the Indo-Aryans move into India, they might bring with them a tradition of a dragon slayer mythos. And normally monster slaying myths are the result of the conflicts between the traditions of the gods worshipped by one people, which come into conflict with the native traditions of gods worshipped by another, such that the resulting stories that recount this conflict uh, will feature the hero of the incoming peoples slaying the gods who were in the landscape who are now turned into monsters, and they become the villains. This is exactly what you get in the Rig Veda, with Indra as the dragon slayer slaying the dragon Vritra, uh, who is often identified with the Dazus, the, the, which are, of course, the Harappan natives who were in the landscapes there. We see the same thing in the Greek myths. A lot of the Greek uh, creatures, such as Typhon, for example, or the Brood of Gaia, were, of course, the Pelasgian and Boeotian uh, snakes and serpents that were worshipped in that landscape before the Indoarians came in and brought with them Zeus and Poseidon and Hades and their sky gods and so forth, such that... Um, in Native American myth, though, I've noticed that in the comic book, the myths of the comic book superheroes, the heroes who were heroes in Native American myth are also the heroes in the comic book mythology, but that the villains in comic book mythology are not Native American heroes, as we would normally expect the case to be. They're actually uh, the residue of the world's mythic traditions. For example, Spider-Man fights Vulture-Man. Vulture-Man is, of course, the ancient Egyptian Ba, uh, the, the picture of the soul, which has a human head and a, and a bird body, that's the ancient Egyptian Ba. Dr. Octopus, is a, the octopus is a very old uh, image of the, the dark monster that, that squashes the sun, grabs the sun with its tentacles and pulls it down into the ocean that you find worshipped in the pottery of Minoan Crete. Um, so all of these monsters that the superhero fights are actually tend to be uh, the creatures from the mythical consciousness structure of other traditions. And it's interesting because I think that New York is very much uh, a part of the rational consciousness structure. Uh, it's, it's de facto mentality is very rational, consistent with it being uh, a late megalopolitan uh, world city of the type that Spengler says. But yet in its popular culture, it, it enlists the aid of Native American heroes and turns them into the semiotics of an immune system to keep out the incursions of the mythical consciousness structure from, from entering into the city. The job of the comic book superhero, and he was invented in New York City and is part of the immune system of New York City, is to keep out the incursions of the mythical consciousness structure. So it's very interesting how these semiotics happen. And normally, so when you take a motif or a character from another mythical system, it very often undergoes a semiotic reversal, a recoding, uh, what Deleuze would call a, a re-territorialization. It becomes deterritorialized and reinscribed with a new code in the new language that makes it consistent with that with that form language. Um, so that's what we can see. I think you can also see the influence of Native American culture forms on the snake handling cults of the Christians. Uh, the rattlesnake cult was one of the big cults of the Hopi. Uh, they still do those dances to this day, and I think the influence on Pentecostal Christians in the South, whether it's a direct influence or not, makes no difference. The fact is, rattlesnakes are worshipped by Native Americans and Christians in the American landscape, but not anywhere else. So there, there is an influence there of the native forms that will gradually transform uh, the incoming forms, the Christian forms, and turn them into something that is more consistent with the form language uh, of the peoples that have been in that, that particular landscape, whatever, whatever it is, absolutely forever. So I think Spangler's theory of race has something to it. I think it's rude, but you'll notice that it's a type of thinking that isn't taught in the universities anymore. Uh, the nihilistic uh, deconstruction of postmodern thought 
has mostly sterilized all of this type of thinking and performed its own dragon slayer myth of turning these types of theories into dragons and monsters and chimeras uh, that to be slain and exiled from the field of academic thought. So that all we're left with, notice that with, with postmodern thought, and Derrida, I think, is, is one of the primary exemplars of this, what we mostly get is a negative uh, creation, which is to say not a creation at all, but a tearing down and dismantling of culture forms. It's not a fundamentally creative endeavor, with a few exceptions, like, of course, Deleuze and Paul Virilio and so forth. But I think it's mostly a, a tearing down of culture forms, and it's, it's disintegrative uh, and nihilistic and not creative. So you won't find any of this type of thinking in the university world anymore, which is why I think it's important for the individual to encounter an encyclopedic mind like a Spangler or a Toynbee or a Gebser, uh, who are no longer taught uh, in the university system precisely because the increase in specialization has rendered the professors myopic uh, to such a degree that they can't comment intelligibly uh, on a book of this size uh, which, which uh, discourses on everything from law to language, all these areas that are outside their area of expertise and which they therefore cannot comment competently upon and as a result of that they tend not to teach these kinds of encyclopedic thinkers. But I think it's absolutely essential, especially for undergrads, to at least encounter one of these kinds of encyclopedic minds and to wrestle with it and work out a worldview, because in doing that, you work out your own worldview and you can see what it looks like to have a complete world picture, a grand meta narrative, which, you know, those are out of fashion now. Leotard and Foucault both outlaw them, and so anything the French say, apparently, we have to, we have to do, we have to be slaves to what the French uh, tell us to do, and so uh, and professors, American professors ac across the water, not all of them, of course, but a great deal of them have, have been slaves to all the new rules and prescriptions laid down by Foucault and Derrida in particular, less so by, by more creative thinkers like Deleuze. Deleuze himself uh, is an encyclopedic mind, um, unlike Foucault, who everyone thinks is an encyclopedic mind but really isn't. He's a European specialist and a specialist on very obscure and arcane corners of European research. But Deleuze was another one of these great encyclopedic minds who invented an entire cosmology. And I want to get to A Thousand Plateaus in, these, in this series of lectures. It's, it's a masterpiece. Probably the greatest book written in the second half of the 20th century. And it carries on this type of encyclopedic thinking into the postmodern world, transforms it so that the semiotics are consistent with postmodern form language, but yet retains uh, an, an alien form, a form that's alien to the postmodern world in terms of content, which is to say an encyclopedic vision of the universe. Deleuze was a grand metaphysician. He's normally, he was of course a Marxist, yet you don't find a lot of discussion of Marx in his books, and he is supposedly a materialist, but uh, I think he was a closet metaphysician. No materialist would come up with a theory about platonic ideas incarnating themselves in matter the way he does, for example, in Difference and Repetition. So he is most decisively a metaphysician. Don't let your professors tell you that he's a materialist. Uh, even if he thought of himself that way, he's still not, uh, most definitely not a materialist. So anyway, where, where was I here? Um, so that's Spengler's theory of race in a nutshell and how uh, ornamentation language is something that undergoes a style transformation. Now, one of the things about or ornamentation language um, it's not, uh, it tends to undergo the, me the metabolism and to undergo change from Gothic to Baroque to Rococo to Modernist, whereas uh, the, the native forms, the peasant forms, uh, will stay largely the same, but the ornamentation language might glide over that stuff. But what happens is that the ornamentation language of a particular culture can be diffused across vast geographical distances if, once that ornamentation language has uh, let's say, adhered to a certain way of decorating swords or a certain way of dress. Uh, once these populations become what Spengler calls fellahim, and this is a cultural residue of primitive peoples, peasants basically and nomads, that come in once a civilization has collapsed and gone through its whole style form. And then you get a, what uh, Toynbee called a folk of wanderung, of migrations of these people. Sometimes they'll take the ornamentation language with them uh, that they've had on what style, as Spengler calls the materials of their race history, not the style history, and they'll carry it with them across landscapes over vast distances, such that we can see, for example, uh, the motif uh, known as the X-ray style shamanic art motif, which we know, for example, originated in the Paleolithic, and the X-ray style is simply, the shaman has X-ray vision, 
Superman has it, but it's an old shamanic uh, motif in which the shaman can see into the inner skeleton of the animal and its inner organs. He can see that because uh, it's part of his, his abilities. And so the art first appears in the Paleolithic, although there aren't a lot of examples of it. There's one classic example uh, of a Paleolithic image of a woolly mammoth with, with a beating heart right in the middle of it. Uh, and it originates there, but it never went into Africa. We don't find the X-ray style of art in Africa at all. It's the one region from the world in which it's missing. But we can track its diffusion across Europe and across Asia down into North America, into Native American art, and all the way down into South America. So you can see that this motif of the X-ray style of art, seeing the internal organs of animals, you can think of, <clears throat> in your mind's eye, people who, who are familiar with like Australian art, you can think of some of their fish images where you can see the skeletons <clears throat> in the image of the fish. It's been diffused all over the world. And along with that, one of the transformations of this is another art motif in which you have an animal form uh, that is decorated involving an elaborate scroll work uh, and with meanders and spirals most familiar probably when you think of the Irish illuminated manuscripts of the Book of Kells where you'll see the dragon emerging uh, out of this impossibly complex lattice work. Some of the Vikings also had the same motif but this motif uh, actually represents uh, the x-ray style of the inner organs of the animal that have exploded out around the animal, there's been a misunderstanding of what the initial x-ray motif was, have exploded out around the animal and become this elaborate foliated scroll work. And it's spread from the Vikings, from the Scandinavian worlds, all the way down into Indonesia, where we find it amongst the Dayak and the Borneo. Some of their uh, scroll work carvings, first glance, look like Scandinavian images to the untrained eye. But the Mongols have, have carried it along, and it's gone into the, the Chinese world and the Shang Dynasty bronzes. They're full of this stuff. Um, you can see that the motif has been carried. So this is one of these examples of an ornamentation language that has become unhooked from a particular geographical locale. In this case, it, it was originally the Paleolithic. Later, the X-ray style motif undergoes a transformation by the Scythians and the Mongols uh, in, of Inner Asia and goes in both directions to into all the way up into Norway and then down into Indonesia and you can see how this this ornamentation is carried along and even misunderstood and retranslated with different semiotics so sometimes the ornamentation will be carried and the same thing happens to of course things like fairy tales fairy tales uh, in opposition to myths myths belong to the ornamentation language they're local uh, they are used to build the style form and erect the civilization and they're rooted in a landscape um, they don't conform. They, they don't, you can't lift them up and put them into another system. What has to happen is that the culture undergoes a disintegration. Then the nomadic peoples in there will carry on just the way they did the ornamentation language, bits and pieces of the myths in the form of fairy tales and folk tales, which they tell around campfires at night, uh, intermixing them with memories of what the myths in that particular ge geographical locale were. And then they'll migrate and they'll carry these myth motifs with them in the form of folk tales and fairy tales, uh, and then they might even elaborate some of these when they get into certain landscapes into giant epos, as in the Scandinavian epos, so that we can see, for example, in the Shahnama, which is written by Ferdowsi in 1000 AD, the original story of Rapunzel, uh, it's there in which the woman has tresses and she lets them down out of the tower so that the hero can, I believe it's the story of, uh, I've forgotten the name, they're the parents of, of Dastan. Uh, the great uh, the great warrior hero Dostan. I've forgotten their the parents' names, but there's the Rapunzel story in a high artwork, a mythic epic of 1000 A.D. that then migrates to become a, one of Grimm's fairy tales when they pick it up as a sort of cult, cultural flotsam and jetsam that some grandmother somewhere has turned into uh, the Rapunzel story that we now tell to our children. So it's wonderful the way these civilizations. Um, are like these living organisms with innards that when they die they become exploded and plundered uh, as though it were a dead corpse that people went inside and ripped out the internal organs and took the internal organs of the culture with them and transmitted them over vast distances. This is a theory known as, as diffusion of course and it's not something that, once again you're going to find your professors talking about because the professors are crippled by their specialization and, and they're taught and trained to know only one area of expertise so once they focus their vision on a single area of expertise, everything else becomes invisible to them. This is why we cannot rely 
on today's uh, current universities to pass along these great educations, these great, full, well-rounded educations that we find in people like Spengler and Gibson and Toynbee and McLuhan and such. Um, so that's the gist of the first half of this chapter, Spengler's racial theory and its relationship to culture forms. I want to do another uh, video on the second half of this chapter, which gets into his theory of language, uh, which occupies the second half.